All right, today I'm gonna to be talking about one of the craziest books that you'll ever read, if you dare to read it. And that book is Juliet by the Marquis de Sade, published between 1797 and 1801. I've got quite a lot to say about this behemoth book that's 1,200 pages and packed full of crime, murder, the most perverse things you can imagine, and a lot of philosophy as well. So let's get into it. Part one, summary. Juliet, or Vice Amply Rewarded, is a companion story to the much more well-known Sard novel, Justine. Justine explores the suffering of the titular heroine, whose strong commitment to virtue and trust condemns her to a life of exploitation and suffering. In Juliet, the titular hero is committed only to crime and evil, and in consequence lives in the lap of luxury and prosperity. For 1,200 pages, we follow Justine's sister, Juliet, as she accumulates greater influence, power, and wealth through murder, corruption, and theft. Interspersed throughout the story are a number of scenarios, increasingly violent and complicated, sometimes funny and sometimes horrific, as well as long passages of philosophy, which covers topics like atheism, politics, morality, art, Darwinism, and even feminism. Part two, there is nothing new under the sun. So one thing that will give you quite a surprise and something that gave me quite a surprise when I was reading the book is how much of the themes and ideas and concepts in that book are things that now, nowadays people talk about and they think that these are like new ideas and yet they're all here in this book that was published in the 1700s. And this is true both in terms of the sexuality and the scenarios that happen in the book but also in terms of the philosophical passages as well. There really are no limits to Sard's imagination when it comes to those sexual scenes. Some of them are hilarious and ridiculous, just bordering on absurd at times, and other ones are really disgusting and you might just want to just skip the page because they're that gross. And some of them are just things out of nightmares. It can definitely make for a difficult read and it actually took me over six months to finish this book because it's just not the sort of book that you can just, you know, sit through and just casually read. It's the sort of book you really have to be in the mood to get through because some of those passages are just gross. And one big difference between Juliet and Justine, if you've read Justine, is that in Juliet, Sard is a lot more frank about some of the grosser sides of things. In Justine, you have the story being told from Justine's perspective, and because Justine is a bit of a prude, she tends to dress things up in slightly nicer language. But Juliet does not do that. She doesn't care about making your stomach turn, and she'll do it over and over and over again in the story. So another big part of the book is the philosophy. Basically, Juliet and Justine as well can be divided into two parts. You have the sexual scene stuff that goes on, and then you have a passage of philosophy, and then you have like bits of adventuring that connect the two, but that's pretty much it. That's the recipe for a Sard novel, it seems. But it is amazing how much ground Sard covers in this book. It pretty much covers every single nihilistic argument that you could think of. He denies the existence of God, he denies the existence of morality, the existence of political authority, basically just denies any kind of value in the world. The only value in Sard's world is taking exactly what you want and getting it. In fact, at one point Sard even weighs in on abortion, basically saying that women don't only have the right to abort their children in the first trimester, he obviously doesn't use those terms, but also a woman has the right to abort her child whenever she wants because it's a product of her body. So <laughs> it's one of the most extreme arguments in favor of abortion that I've ever read. So if you're interested in learning about nihilism and all of those kinds of nihilistic arguments, give this book a go because it does basically contain all of them. It's basically just an encyclopedia of these things. I would say that sometimes the arguments aren't the best, sometimes the arguments border on the ridiculous, but that might be because sometimes I think Saad is also just playing around and having fun and shocking people, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in any case, there's lots of interesting stuff going on and it really is surprising how so many ideas that we have and talk about today were things that were being talked about or at least thought about by people in Sard's time. Part three, satire or serious? So I think it's important when reading Sard not to take him all that seriously. I think it's quite clear that at times Sard's intention with his work is to shock and to provoke a response, especially given the very repressive time that he was writing in. Also, the fact that some of the scenes in the book are just so far-fetched and absurd, it's hard to do anything except not take them seriously. But what's interesting about the book as well is that 
Although Assad clearly sometimes is having fun, there are little parts of the book where he teases the reader and kind of suggests that there may be more truth in some of the events that he's describing than might first appear. So one example of this is where he actually has the Pope, or the current Pope I think at the time that he was writing in, appear in the story and engage in some of the cruel libertine activities. And there's also a scene in which I think it is the Pope himself, he basically does a big laundry list of atrocities that people in power have done over time. And so there are little moments like this where it seems like Saad is actually talking about real people and real events. And then there's even this footnote where Saad seems to suggest that the characters in the story are real people that have just been given different names to protect their identities. So throughout the story Saad is always playing with this idea that Maybe some of this did happen, and maybe I'm just embellishing it, but you don't really know, and I'm going to keep teasing you about it the whole way through. So you kind of see the novel as having kind of two possible interpretations. One would be Saad exposing the aristocracy for the corrupt system that it was, or he's just being a massive troll and trying to get a rise out of people. And I think for the most part, both of these are probably true. And it's no wonder then that after publishing this book, Saad found himself in prison, I believe without a trial, for the rest of his life. But overall, I would say that you shouldn't take the story all that seriously, because Saad is clearly satirising things at times, and he's clearly having a great time doing that and getting a rise out of people. But what makes it interesting is there is just that little taste of reality underneath, that suggestion that maybe some of this is going on. And that just adds this real darkness to the story, because if Saad is exposing people and the activities that they've done, then it would make for a very terrifying story. Part 4. Rinse and Repeat So Juliet is a very repetitive novel and it's a very long novel. The edition that I have is 1,200 pages. I started reading the book in January and I've only just got round to finishing it now because it's just not the kind of book that I want to read every day. Now part of that is because the content of the book is quite heavy going, but also it is because the book is very repetitive, and so reading it day in and day out can feel quite monotonous. It's basically just like, oh, and here we go again with another orgy, or here we go again with another philosophical rant about how God doesn't exist. And so if you're reading it continuously, that can get old pretty quick. Now that makes sense given that it's partly an erotic work. Erotica tends to be quite repetitive, and so if you're going to write 1,200 pages of it, it's going to get old pretty quick. And even the philosophical passages can be quite repetitive as well. There are lots of arguments against the existence of God and against the existence of morality. And so I think if you're reading it continuously, it's really hard to see the differences in these arguments and it just seems like the same thing over and over again. But if you leave gaps between reading it, I think that's a lot better. It certainly worked for me. I didn't get too bored because I'd read about 200 pages a month and then just leave it. And when I came back, things were a bit hazy, so actually some of the repetitiveness was quite useful, especially with the philosophy, because you can kind of get it rejigged in your brain a bit. Another thing as well about the repetition is that it's not just the same thing every time, even though sometimes it can feel like it. As I've said, Saad has a very, very broad imagination, and so even if the scenes in general are doing the same things, he always takes it to the next level. In fact, I remember several parts of the book where I would read one of those scenes and think, it really can't get any more gross than this, or it really can't get any more horrific than this. And then here we are 200 pages later and something even worse is happening. So Saad really does have a broad imagination and that does keep things interesting, even if they are somewhat repetitive. Nevertheless, I'd recommend if you do read this book, it's quite an undertaking, it's quite repetitive, so take your time with it. Don't try and read it all in one go because you'll definitely give up. Part 5. Is Juliet a feminist novel? So one of the things that I find very interesting about Saad, and in particular this book, is whether it shows that Saad has a feminist side to his work. Now a lot of people think that he doesn't, because his work is full of women that get victimised, but when you read Juliet I think you get a little bit of a different perspective on Saad and his work. I think for me, I do think that Juliet is in essence a somewhat feminist work for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you have to look at the difference between Juliet's character and her sister Justine. Now Justine is the ultimate victim. She suffers continuously because she tr always tries to be good and people take advantage of it. Now Juliet is the exact opposite of this. She doesn't care for virtue at all, she goes out and she commits crime. And she does this for herself because she wants to. She's a very active character. And so in one sense this is a sort of feminist character in that you have a character 
who has agency and desires that they go out and get for themselves. And this is sort of even true of Justine. Even though Justine gets victimized, she often chooses to be a victim. She finds herself in these situations where evil libertines will tell her, you know, either help me murder this person or I'm going to abuse you. And she takes the abuse because she doesn't want to commit crime. So in terms of Saad's characters and their psychologies, they're certainly not the traditional passive female kinds of characters. Both of them have a set of principles and drives and they follow them, even if that takes them to some very dark places. Obviously for Justine it leads to some suffering, but for Juliet it leads to success because she's evil and in the world of Saad, being evil is a good thing. I think another thing that's interesting with respect to this feminist theme is to look at the story of Juliet and the structure and her evolution as a character. So at the beginning of the story, Juliet gets initiated into the world of crime, not by men, but by women. She's in a nunnery and she starts to explore her sexuality with these nuns, shall we say. And that's her first introduction to the world of crime, which is quite interesting because it's already the beginning of the story is in an all-female environment. So she's not being kind of led by a male figure, which is something you might expect in a more traditional story. But then in the early story, Juliet is very much submissive to men. She works for this guy called Saint Fond and he respects her and he lets her partake in all the revels that they have. But he does make it very clear to her at several times that she is kind of one step below him and she is basically dependent on him. And then he kicks her out because she has a moment of guilt and he doesn't like that. And from that point on, Juliet has to make it on her own. And for the second half of the whole book, we see Juliet as she's becoming more and more powerful and independent until ultimately she doesn't need anyone else because she's made her own fortune through theft and murder. And I think the icing on the cake for Juliet's story and character arc comes at the very end of the story when there's this wedding scene between her and a male lover and they both get married to two other people and for one of the marriages Juliet plays the role of the groom and in the other marriage she plays the role of the bride and so does the male. And that to me seems to be a very egalitarian symbol, right? If you're playing both roles in the marriage, it suggests that you're at the position where you can play a ma masculine role or a feminine role. And Juliet seems to just transcend the boundaries of gender and everything else by the time we get to the end of the story. So whether that makes Juliet a feminist novel, I don't know, maybe you think it doesn't, but it certainly makes it a very interesting story. And Juliet is certainly a very empowered character by the end of the story. Part six, conclusion. So overall, I'm glad I managed to get through this book. I'm not gonna lie, at times it was pretty hard going and there are bits where it does get quite boring, especially when some of it feels a bit too repetitive. That being said, it's definitely worth it if you can get through it and it was quite satisfying to finish the book in the end. It's amazing how a book that was written in the 1700s still has the power to be incredibly shocking and more shocking and extreme than things that get published today. Also, if you're interested in philosophy and in particular nihilism and you want to read a book that's not going to put you to sleep then this might not be a bad book to choose because it covers basically every nihilistic argument you can think of and more. The only thing I would say that goes counts against this book is that it is incredibly long and if you haven't read any Saad before I would definitely recommend reading one of his shorter works just to kind of get you up to speed with his themes and his ideas because I think going into Juliet is quite a task. Also definitely make sure that you read Justine, the sister novel to this one. It's also a lot shorter, but obviously Justine is a bit of a sap. So if you want to read the story of the more interesting and powerful female character, then you should go with Juliet. All right, that's it for today's video. Please let me know what you think of Juliet in the comments. Have you read this book? Have you read its companion book, Justine? And if so, what did you think of them? As always, I look forward to discussing this more with you in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to my channel. I upload new videos twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays. But that's it for this video, so take care everyone. Ta-ra!